Well, hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Singapore Parenting Festival is proudly presented to you by the Asian Parent and Media Corp. Uh, a big thank you to our Go partners as well, PCF Sparkle Thought, uh, Dumex Do Group, Scott, and also content partners, Moms for Life, Dads for Life, Center for Fathering, and Hoya. Oh, so today we'll dive into the topic of cultivate joy in learning. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Xiao Jiahui, and I'm a radio DJ, a producer presenter with Media Cup Radio, Yes 933. It's a Chinese radio station, and I helm the lunchtime belt from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'm also a mother of one. Uh, I have one lovely daughter. When she doesn't make me angry, she's really very cute. <laughs> Uh, she's in primary one this year, so it's a transition year for her and me as well. And it's very challenging, I would say. And also, um, on my social media, some of you might be familiar with that uh, because I have a lot of Chinese storytelling videos that I've been sharing for the past few years. I also have a podcast going on, which you can look for my podcast on Spotify uh, because my main aim in the Chinese storytelling in all the videos and podcasts is to hope that I'll be able to contribute in a way that I hope to spark children's interest in learning Chinese. That's what I really, really hope, okay? Uh, so for today, we have read very exciting content for you as well. So today we have two speakers coming on to share their expertise. Uh, first of all, we have Angela Young. Hi, Angela. Hello. She's, <laughs> she's the Director, Professional and Education Development of the PAP Community Foundation, and she has a lot of experience in the education sector, planning and overseeing the development and, and implementation of the school's curriculum. So Angela will be speaking first later. And also, we have our second speaker for the night. She's Finn Saw. She is an educator, Hello. author. Hi, Finn. I've been following you on Instagram as well. <laughs> okay, I've been following her for years, actually. She's the founder of Happy Thought Shelf. So if you're always looking for um, creative ideas on how you can make learning interesting for your kids at home, be sure to follow her. Okay, uh, it's a very popular educational website and Instagram that helps parents make learning fun and meaningful for children. Okay, so I've introduced our two speakers for today. First of all, let's have Angela. Can you share with us more on what tips you can advise us today? Sure. So um, maybe I'll, I'll start by wishing everyone a good evening, mummies and daddies uh, over here. I'm Angela and I'm delighted to be here today to share about uh, this topic over here, instilling the joy of learning. So I'm sure we all know that as parents and educators, we want the best for our children. So we want them to grow up to be happy, successful and fulfilled individuals that thrive in an age of constant change and innovation. And I think one of the best things that we can do to help our children achieve these goals is to instill in them a love for learning. And children will naturally not want to learn if learning becomes a chore for them. So we want our children to have the willingness and desire to learn beyond the needs of school and work. And we want them to see the learning process as one that enriches their life and brings profound joy and satisfaction to them. More importantly, we really want them to be self-directed learners. So when we talk about joy of reading, uh, sorry, joy of learning, so what exactly is the joy of learning? Why is it so important? And how can parents help spark joy and sustain joy in their children's learning journey? Firstly, for learning to be joyful, it needs to be fun, right? Children are naturally curious about the world around them and they are raring to explore, to play. And play is not just fun and games. Play allows our children to emulate what they see and practice the skills. Play also allows our children to explore, to experiment and wonder about things that work. And as they do that, they actually make sense of things around them and learn. So now, we want children to be intrinsically motivated to learn, to engage in an activity, and to genuinely like doing that. Because when they are motivated by their own interest and enjoyment of the process, parents will not need to use rewards, threats, and punishment you know, to push our children to learn. The children will be ready to take ownership of their own learning. They'll be ready to take on new challenges, and they really want to excel in what they are doing. And that's what we call the growth mindset. And why is this important? And the truth is, 
as much as parents are concerned about the academics of our children, success is not determined solely by our children's academic performance or their test scores. The scores will only indicate the level of mastery our children have for a particular subject. And that's for yesterday's knowledge. What about the future? So uh, we want to talk about executive functioning skills because as research shows, um, executive functioning skills are better predictors for success. Um, executive functions are a set of cognitive skills that enables us to focus, to plan ahead, to self-regulate our emotions, and to adapt to new situations. And these skills depend on three types of brain functions. First, working memory, which is the ability to retain information temporarily. Inhibitory control, which is the ability to exercise self-control. And cognitive flexibility, which is the ability to adapt to unplanned or changing situations. So children with strong executive functions are able to manage their time, organize their thoughts, manage their own behavior, and build positive relationships with others. They are more likely to engage in self-directed learning and are better equipped to handle challenges and curveballs that life throws at them. And these are the enduring and transferable life skills that we want our children to have so that they can thrive in a VUCA world. So how can we help our children love learning and kill two birds with one stone, which is to learn at the same time, practice their executive functioning skills. So we want to acknowledge that learning is a lifelong pursuit. It goes beyond the formal schooling that we receive and it continues throughout our personal and professional life. Learning also takes place in different contexts and spaces. It could be in school, it could be in the community, in Amma's house or at home. So simply put, learning doesn't just take place in school. And as parents, we need to set up the opportunities for our children to continue to have fun learning in informal settings. And parents play a very pivotal role in their children's education journey. Research shows that when parents are involved in their children's education, children are more ready to transition to formal schooling and have better self-esteem. Therefore, we hope that you can walk with your child on the journey of learning, celebrate the successes and joy of learning when your child accomplishes something new. Yeah, so, Angela, actually, I think that a lot of parents would like to be involved in the learning journey of the right. children. But it's just that, you know, I've talked to so many friends. They are always so busy with their jobs. I have several mommy friends who go out as early as like 7 plus in the morning, come back home only at 9 plus at night. So when I ask them, how, how, how do they find time to teach their children homework or even like to have fun with them? Their answers to me were like, I can't do that on weekdays. I can only do it over the weekends. But over the weekends, they will also still be so tired. So um, in a way, we also know that quality time is more important than quantity time, right? But how do we make sure that parents are doing the right things or, or maximizing the learning opportunities for our children when we are all so busy? Or how can parents do, what can parents do to, to actually make learning more fun for our children when we don't have all the time in the world to be with them all the time? I think that's a very good question, Xiaohui. I, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of parents are struggling with time, right? So constrained yeah. by, by the time that is available to them. So I'll be sharing some tips later, but I can give you some preview. So for example, right, um, I'm sure parents cook at home, right? So cooking is an excellent activity to teach your children sequencing. For example, you have, uh, so you can say, um, maybe my, my child is uh, Joanne. So Joanne, now we are going to put the flour in a bowl, okay? Next, we are going to place the eggs in there. And then we are going to do this. And lastly, you put it in the oven at X degrees Celsius, you will have a cake in 20 minutes. So that teaches children sequencing. And at the same time, if you, you know, if you bathe your children, for example, during bath time, you can make use of that opportunity to teach them about body safety skills. How can they keep themselves safe, right? And um, you, you can also talk about hygiene practices. Right or during meal times, you can talk about nutrition. You can talk about food. You know, uh, and and you can bring in culture. So learning doesn't have to be very. You don't have to set aside a particular time just to do that. When it comes to daily routines, those are great opportunities for parents to also interact and also teach their children, or maybe not teach, just interact and also facilitate some discussion. Uh, when it comes to you know uh the things that they they see day to day, and I think that's also learning for the children as well. Right. Yeah, I think we should really try to make ourselves 
Or you have to make the conversations more interesting for the children as well. <laughs> right, that's right. Yeah, just to make sure that when we go home, we still have energy to chat with the children, to teach them certain things, to share with them different things as well in our lives. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Jiahui. So maybe I will move on to share some practical strategies, right, where we can mm. make learning Maybe, uh, I mean, parents are very concerned about language and numeracy, right? So how do we make learning language and numeracy fun for our children? And I'll also share how we can variate some of the activities so that we can help our children practice executive functioning skills. Remember, we want to kill two birds with one stone. We don't have yeah. time already. Let's you know, make, make good use of that time. Effective learning. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and... And these materials that I'll be mentioning in the next couple of slides, you can find them at home. Or if you don't have them at home, you can always substitute them with other materials. So aside from the strategies, I'll also be sharing a little on how we can work with our children's teachers and school to complement and enhance our children's learning. So if you look at this, this is an activity on letter recognition. So, um, you know, sometimes when we speak with our children, we want them to write the letter A multiple times or to say the letter A several times. But instead, we can use DO to form letters. And this engages multiple senses of our children, you know, sight, touch, hearing. And it creates a more memorable experience for them than just looking at letters on a page or hearing you say A, right? You can also use Lego blocks for these activities. You just have to form the letters on the plate and have children trace over them with their fingers, or they can also recreate the letters using Lego blocks. Um, you know, if, if you happen to be outdoors, you can get your children to form the letters using dried leaves, mm. stones, twigs that they can find on the ground, or even write on the sand. Or you can also use a viewfinder. You make a viewfinder together with your children. Spot the letter A in the environment. Do you know letter A in our, in our environment can come in different fonts? So, so you can ask questions like that to, to excite them to, to learn. And um, this is on introducing letters. So when we introduce letters to children, we do not need to start by teaching them A, B, C, D, E. I mean, knowing how to recite the alphabets in order has to do with memorization, mm. which is broad learning, right? But we can make letter recognition more meaningful for our children by starting off with letters in their names, for example. This makes letters more relatable to them. Or we can start off with the following letters that we have over here. S, T, P, I, A, N. We can get the children to look for letters with straight or curly tails, with tall and straight back, or to get them to recognize the letters. We can even ask the children to group letters according to their own rules. And that's cognitive flexibility in action already. Right? And um, these few letters, when we... We can use that same few letters to enable a child to form several words. So using the S T P I N, right, we can form pin, pen, pin, sit. And these are what we call word families, right? Having these letters on Lego blocks allows, sorry, having these letters on Lego blocks will allow our children to put together different combinations of the letters to form words. And this is a good way for them to learn new words incidentally and a more interesting way to learn how to spell. So if you want to make this activity more challenging and for children to practice their executive functioning skills, you can add instructions like form the word sit using only red color blocks. Oh, or you can wow. form as many words as possible in 10 seconds. So children may end up forming what we call uh, silly words, words <laughs> that don't make sense, right? But that's perfectly all right because this is how they have shown that they, have, they are ready to build words using letters. So the next activity is, um, you know, how we can develop children's confidence in the identification of high-frequency words. So high-frequency words are the commonly used words in a text, and knowing them will help to build our children's confidence in reading passages and promote fluency in reading, which leads to understanding uh, what they have read, you know, in terms of the passage. So, um, sorry, you can, you can actually incorporate a simple ball game where you call out a word, and your child rolls the ball towards the word. Or you can also do a treasure hunt where you hide the different high-frequency words in your home and ask your child to go and look for them, right? Next one. This is uh, another activity on uh, word families. And um, just like the Lego activity that I've shared earlier, right? This is a wonderful activity for children to learn how to blend sounds, to form new words, and to learn how to read and spell. And this is because word families share the same ending sound and spelling. 
So when you manipulate or you substitute the beginning sound with other letters, it will help children to learn new words faster. For example, cat and hat, bark and hug, right? Children can explore the different endings and form different words. So one last activity, this last activity will help children to develop number sense. So we can draw up a 10 frame over here and 10 frames, right? They provide a visual representation of numbers and helps children to subitize. Uh, subitization is the ability to recognize the number of objects without needing to count. And this is a very important skill as it helps children to understand more complex skills like addition and subtraction in future. So you can make this activity challenging for your children by removing the time frame is also one way to assess if your child can subitize without visual cues. So we can also use 10 frames to help children pair an object with a number word. For example, if I place um, two Yakko covers over there, right, then the children can just say uh, number two. So this is what we call one-to-one -one correspondence. And I think just following up on what uh, Jia Hui asked earlier about very busy parents, right? Mm. This activities that we have over here looks like it requires some preparation work. And I think working parents, we all know, struggle with time. So how can you make learning fun for your children? I'm going to propose two ways. First, read together regularly, okay? The benefits of reading cannot be underestimated, even if it is just 15 minutes a day. Okay, read with your child, talk about the illustrations together and encourage your child to read with you. Increase the number of books made available to your child. So a study done by the Singapore Kindergarten Impact Project found that the frequency of reading together, the number of books available to the child and the child's interest in reading had the most significant influence on their language and literacy skills. Children also learn reading skills better from reading with their parents than from being taught how to read by their parents. So the key thing I'm trying to say here is to read together, okay? And learning can also take place on the go. You can use simple games like I Spy when you bring your child out to help them learn vocabulary and numeracy concepts. For example, you can ask your child to search for items in the home that looks like the number nine. So give your child some time your child might come back and bring you a ladle or a hook <laughs> or a handle of a teacup. So just be open-minded and creative about it, okay? That's, that's a great learning opportunity for them. And parents can also find out more about how their child is learning or whether the child is learning the enjoying the process of learning by communicating with your child or their teachers. So some question you may want to ask your child's teachers can be, what are my child's strengths? What can I do to support my child's learning at home? And some of the questions listed here over uh, this slide. This will give you a good sensing of your child's interest, their progress in school, and how you can do some hands-on and fun activities with your children to complement their learning at home. Right? Okay, so work with your child's teacher. Do some following up at home. You can support your child by extending what your child is learning in school or by reinforcing certain skills and concepts at home. So sometimes children can demonstrate certain skills at home that they don't in school. And you will see this in your children's developmental checklist, right? Sometimes your teacher will just take off something like in progress. And, and I think you, would, you saw that particular skill at home. So go back, tell your teacher, that, no, my child did this at home. I think she, he or she has already acquired this skill. Mm. So highlight this to your child's teacher. And I think schools are very cognizant about the positive benefits of strong parental involvement. And I am sure they plan several activities to involve parents in their children's learning, join these activities and learn how you can better support your child's learning through meaningful yeah. activities that allow you to bond and have fun with your child. Yeah, I actually really right. agree with that because when my child was still in preschool, every now and then I'll have a chat with the teachers. Actually, I think the teachers were very nice also. Every time they see me, they'll tell me, hey, how my child is doing in school? What should I pay attention to, etc." And just now you were mentioning about following up at home, right? Which also reminds me, I want to show everybody something that I have at home, which I think will be very educational for all parents to have this at home too. These are called linking cubes. I wasn't aware of their existence until one day I was looking at uh, mom influencers 
IG, Instagram. Then I asked my child, hey, this is very cute. Do you think you want it? Um, it's, it's similar to Lego, but it's not exactly the same. And it's really affordable as well. I think like 100 cubes is probably around $12. When I asked my child about this, she was actually telling me, oh, I have this in school. We use it to learn maths. So I thought, hey, I'll just get the same set for her to learn at home. But um, the thing is that when she uses all these linking cubes to learn numbers in school, to learn maths in school, at home, we don't really do that. At home, we use all this for her to unleash her creativity, she could build robots, she could build like, um, or, or maybe like design a flower using all this. So I thought it's similar things, but we can do uh, using the same materials, doing different things to make her feel that it's actually fun to, to learn at home, to learn in school using the same materials. And I think this is something that all parents can, can consider as well. You know, Jia Hui, what you are doing is a perfect, role modeling of cognitive flexibility <laughs> because in school, they use it for numeracy concepts right but when your child brings it home or when you have it at home firstly you are extending your child's learning at home whether it's uh, you know numeracy or whether it's aesthetics or arts or even 3d visualization right but other than that you are also letting your child you know change the rules of the game who says linking cubes are just for numeracy. I can use it for something else. So that's a perfect role modeling that you are doing over there. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, for this, right, probably some people are curious. Um, how like how old should the children be before they start using this? Any recommendations, Angela? Even though on the packaging it says that three plus three plus onwards. I think you can use them uh, as young as three years old. If you if you say we can use them for one to one correspondence, like. For example, I have one cube, then I can associate it with number one. If I place two cubes, it's uh, two, you know, things like that. So you can start as young and just make use of the materials that are available at home. Yeah, sure. And also there's one part when we are just now, uh, you were sharing that probably we could also check with the child as well, how her day went. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there specific like questions, how we can ask the children to make sure that we know what they have been learning in school and that's when we can like try to have a similar environment for them to learn at home also. How, how should we ask the children? Okay, I think the best way is to keep your questions as open-ended as possible. So something as general as, can you just tell me about your day? Um, what do you do with your teacher in school today? Uh, what activity did you do? What do you like about it? What you don't like about it? Because I think this is a this is an uh, you know a perfect opportunity for them to be able to share and express themselves. So so uh, and from their you no know, dialogue right that you both or interactions that both of you have, you will be able to sense hey, do they like the activity? What their interest lies in, and that's where you can use it in your own home uh, learning and the activities that you plan for your children. So keep it as open-ended as possible. Mm, okay, open-ended questions. Don't mm. ask a yes or no question. <laughs> right. Because that's not going to encourage the child to speak up and share more about those yeah, live yeah. in school. Okay, anything else you'd like to share with us, Angela? No, so uh, maybe I'll just end off. I think we've spoke um, extensively about uh, you know ways where we can help our children enjoy the process of learning and helping them to want to learn. So I hope uh, some of these strategies over here can provide you with some ideas on how you can make learning fun for your children and motivate them to want to learn more. But more importantly, every child is unique. They are strong, competent, and capable. They enter the world ready to learn, okay? And they have different interests and personalities and develop at different paces in their own way and rate. So mummies and daddies, take your time to get to know your child understand their likes and dislikes and learn along with them. Remember to praise them when they try something new. It encourages them a lot. Play with them, read to them and discover the joy of learning together. Thank you so much, Thank Angela. You. Thank you. That's a great point, to play together with them. So when we play together, we're not just their parent. We could be their friends. We could be their playmates as well. And that's when all of us, parent and child, can actually find more fun and joy in learning. It's not just, doesn't just apply to the children, but to the parents as well, okay? Uh, very soon, we'll have another speaker, Finn, coming up uh, to share more about how we can provide a nurturing environment for our kids. Sure, I have to speak very softly, <laughs> but yet with all the correct intonation, with the correct expressions, so that I can make the story interesting to her. And that's how she can get more interested to learn English 
and even more so Chinese, because I realized there's a lot of parents in the in the chat in the Q and A asking about how to spur the child's interest in learning Chinese. So I think probably the right reading style is very important. Right, I, I think the the reading like you know your your weekly session with your daughter it also forms this very strong connection i think this is the this is the connection that really motivates your children and really uh, helps them um, enjoy you know reading um, so uh, so this is one part and also when you know, bring your child to a library is an excellent thing to do because you, you are actually you know giving them the 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 choice so they can go around and look for books that are interest uh, interesting to them not that we choose the books for them Exactly. Yeah, so, exactly. Right. Yeah. So so I I also bring my my I bring my kids to the library very often. And you know, it's so interesting about the to see the kind of books that they 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 reach for. And it's not the book that I'll choose my own on my own. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because like when my child went to the library last week, she actually chose a book on jokes. I didn't even realize that she likes books like that. Right. This is like really silly, lame jokes, but she enjoys it so much. But and to me, as long as she reads, as long as she learns new words, to me, that's that's really enough. Yeah, and that's how they discover new things also. Like my son found a book about volcano, and then you know, maybe like at like nine years last year, she found he found a book about magic, and then he got him very interested in learning about magic tricks. Yeah. Mm. So this is really this is uh really very, very uh uh a very good way. Books are a really good way to help children discover other interest yeah so other than reading what tips do you have to offer ah uh, okay so um next i'm gonna so whatever that i've shared so far right is about um creating a, a basic learning space at home so for those of you who want to up your learning space game right i have something else to share and that is wow. to set up a discovery corner so what do we have in the discovery corner so you can actually display learning activities and uh, objects of interest that can spark your children's curiosity so you can put things like a piece of leaf you can you know pick up a piece of leaf or a photograph and a postcard or a page from a magazine, uh, maybe even an old stamp or newspaper cut up. So over here in this picture, um, on the left, right on this clipboard, I I I hope you guys can see clearly. So this is a picture of a very ugly looking fish. So I saw this ugly looking <laughs> fish on the Net Geo magazine one day, and I thought, oh my, you know, it caught my attention. It looks really weird. So I decided to fold the page and I just put it on a clipboard, and then I just, and I just put it on the bookshelf. And then the next morning, when my children they woke up, and they walked past, and I, you know they noticed this. Fish immediately, and they you know they ask mom, what what is this fish? What is this creature? Is it is it still alive? You know, is this from you know is this prehistoric? And um and it sparked so um so much discussion about um deep sea creatures. So so for so for those of you who are not uh, who do not know this fish, this is the angler fish, and it lives in the deep sea. So um yeah, and then we went on to to go and, and find out and research more more about the other weird looking deep sea creatures. So that was really fun for my children. And over here on the right, so you see this whole shelf. So on the shelf, I have all the learning activities uh, for my children to learn about the different festivals and celebrations all over the world. So it was uh, during, I think this was set up during Christmas time last year. So, you know, I wanted to, um, um, I wanted to let them learn about Christmas and on top of Christmas and all the other celebrations around the world as well. So we got books on the shelf, we got some learning activities on the shelf. All right, so this is uh, the discovery corner. Let's move on to point number two and that, okay, oh, so, um, so conducive learning space. So you want to create an environment that encourage our children to learn and explore freely. So this is really what uh, the discovery corner can do. Next, um, scheduling a regular home learning time. So what do I mean by this? You can do so by blocking off a small amount of time each day for learning at home. Now you can schedule this home learning time every day, every alternate day, every weekend. It's really up to you and what works for your family. And for the duration, it can be you know, five minutes, it can be 10 minutes, it can be 30 minutes. But more importantly, it's really uh, your, your children's age. Uh, or when it comes to the duration of this home learning time, because for very young children, we cannot force them to sit down and do learning for for you know extended amount of time. They have very short attention span, and we got to respect that. And for older children, and let's say if they have already developed this habit of learning every day at home, then they will have a naturally they will have a longer attention span, and they will be able to focus longer, like thirty minutes to an hour. 
And uh, what do we do during this home learning time? Um, so I, ha I have three kids, two of them are in primary school and one in preschool. So for my primary school kids, they have homework to do. So we do homework. Uh, I will do, you know, I'll go through homework with them. We'll do revision. And um, after, you know, they have, they are done with their schoolwork. And then we can also find fun activities. Like uh, we can, we, we look for some science experiments to do, or we do some fun crafts. We draw something together. We paint something together. Uh, some, uh, you know, uh, and some, uh, uh, hands-on learning activities. We can also explore topics that they are interested in. So if they are interested in um, dinosaurs, we can pick up a book about dinosaurs or we can go on the internet to research about dinosaurs. So what we want to achieve here with this regular home learning time is to really make learning part of their daily life and to develop this habit of learning in our children. Moving on, making learning fun. So how do you make learning fun? Uh, um, you want to, uh, you can make learning fun by, by including lots of hands-on, sensorial and interactive activities. And this is especially important for younger children because they, they learn a lot by doing, by playing and using their different senses. And um, concrete experiences, they will stick in the brain better and longer for children. So for example, I think earlier on, Angela shared about learning math. So she shared about this 10 frame. So instead of just showing your kids a, a cut of like number 10 and 10 blocks, right? Uh, you know, get them to really place the 10, 10 border caps in the 10 frames. That will really help them understand what's the meaning of 10. So in this picture over here, my daughter, uh, I think she's um, three years old at this time. She's learning about numbers. She's learning counting. Instead of get, I'm just showing her again, like number cuts, right? I got her to use her little finger to dab into the paint and she was making raindrops and she was counting along as she was making raindrops. So this really helps her understand what the numbers represent. And in the second activity here, I got her to make clubs. So we are learning about C is for clubs and she was using cotton wool and C is for cotton wool, cotton as well. So she was making cotton wool with, with these, uh, um, with, with these, uh, with, uh, uh, with making clouds with these cotton wool. So, you know, this kind of experiences really stick with them. You know, after like maybe a year later, my, my, my children will come back. Oh, mommy, do you remember this activity that I did with you? We're using cotton wool. Yeah. So um, I really encourage all of you to think about how you can make learning as hands-on and as uh, interactive and uh, sensorial as possible for your children. Yeah, this seems really fun, actually. Yeah, my, my, my children, they, they, they love it. And um, yeah, and it is, you know, you'd be surprised that, you know, after a year, they remember all, mm. all these fun things that they do. It's not just for teaching them the concept, but, you know, all this connection and all these good memories about learning will help them feel better about learning. They develop this positive attitude towards learning. They think that learning is so fun. And um, my next tip is to play up to their interest. So how, how you can make learning fun is to play up to their interest. So I have this example over here. Um, when my son was younger, he was he suddenly was very interested in Star Wars. So um, um I from Star Wars, we we you know I tried to uh, so we went on to learn about planets and moons and stars. And um, so over here in this activity, right? Uh I we went to research about the different number of moons. Uh, around that's orbiting around each planet and then he went on to to create a graph about it and then in this second activity I printed out like small Star Wars character and I asked him to use this Star Wars character and create his own Star Wars story Star Wars comic so he was pasting the characters and he was drawing you know if you can see the trees and um, um and then he was also writing those speech bubbles and and um, at a point of time he couldn't write so I was the one who was writing for him for, for him. So he told me his, all these fun stories and I wrote it down for him. And we kept this story until now. Uh, every time we take it out to read, it will have so, it brings back so much fun memory and we will laugh, we will be laughing at, uh, at all these um, stories. So, um, so really like, you know, this is Star Wars, but you know, this is uh, what my son is interested in. And I use what he is interested in to teach him about science. We teach him about math. We teach him about writing and literacy. Yeah. So the parents so, have to be like really creative as well. So I hope the attendees, the parents here are really taking down notes. All these are so useful <laughs> for, for our, the ideas to play. And I have one for, for, for the frozen friends, uh, fans, ah, right? Yeah, so my snowflake. daughter, 
<laughs> yeah, I saw recently they watched Frozen and they were so obsessed with Elsa. Any, any one of your daughters also obsessed with Elsa and, uh, and Winter and Snowflakes. So this is an activity for you. So uh, what happened is that, yeah, so they were very obsessed with Elsa. So I thought that, oh, okay, so they want to learn more about Winter. And we have no Winter in Singapore, right? So it's okay. Uh, we can create some Winter team activities at home. So I got her to make Snowflakes with cotton bud. And um, this activity may look very simple but it really you know it helps children to develop their fine motor skills because they are holding the small cotton bud and placing them on the line it also helps them learn about the very unique hexagonal shape of a snowflake and the second activity we also got um, some cap stickers and uh, my children built an igloo and we also learned about who lives in an igloo what's an igloo used for and where can you find an igloo so very very interesting things that you can also learn from frozen <laughs> Yeah, okay, moving on to the next point. We're interested okay. to know more. Schedule downtime. Oh. Right, schedule downtime. So you guys are going to love this tip because basically you don't have to do anything. And I'm asking you to let your child do nothing. So... um. <laughs> Yes, so this is downtime and downtime is really, really important, especially for older children. They spend a large amount of time in school and, and they go through structured lesson, lesson after lesson. So this downtime is important for them to unwind, to relax. And also, this is also the time where they can go explore their interests. So um, very quickly, my daughter here, again, she created this during her own free time. And uh, she was, uh, we found some tadpoles and we got some tadpoles at home. So she was so interested in the life cycle of the frog and she created this pond with paper plate and she made these tadpoles with clay. And over here also another drawing by my four-year-old. She drew this tadpole pond uh, and we, uh, uh, on, you know, it's about the day when we went to catch the tadpoles. So this was all done during their free time and you'll be amazed by how much your, your children's love of learning can grow when they have the time to explore, to discover. And, and yeah, and boredom, okay, boost creativity and encourages self-learning. So if your child looks bored, right, don't, don't rush in to entertain your child. Just let him be, uh, let him or her be bored. And today, will you know, children are so creative. They can come up with so many ways to entertain themselves. And uh, and you know, this is also the time where they can um uh, uh discover and and uh, make make fascinating discoveries about the world. Hmm. Okay. Great. Oh, this is another point that's very important as well. <laughs> and um, last. Uh, so the, this last point here is about developing a safe, trusting relationship with your child. So this goes beyond the physical environment and the routines. So earlier on, what I've shared is about really um, designing the physical environment and also looking at your child's routine. But this looks at that at the social environment at home. So your, your child's social interactions and their relationship with, with the family members. So what you we really want is a home environment where kids feel safe and connected. And this is important because feeling safe is one of the most basic needs of human beings and children learn better when they they feel safe and they feel um that the, the, that the environment is um is supportive so um you know, just simply put a stressed out brain is not a learning brain so i believe based on your own experiences you will know that you know if you are trying to learn something and you are so anxious and uptight you will, you're not going to learn well uh, whereas in uh, on the contrary right if you are relaxed and you're happy then you you'll definitely be able to absorb things better and also, um, the when when children feel safe, then they are more willing to to jump into new experiences. They are more uh, they have the confidence to to explore the world freely, and um, they are also willing to to uh, they will be more willing to make mistakes. All right, they're not afraid to make mistakes. So here are some ways that you can. Uh, develop a safe, trusting, connected relationship with your child. One is to find ways to connect with your child daily, you know, eating meals together, regular home learning time. Another uh, way is to start and end your days with positive interaction. So you can, you know, in the morning, give your child a hug. At night, can read them a bedtime story. Mm, okay. And uh, holding space for safe space for children to make mistakes. So not scolding them when they make a mistake. Uh, not yelling at them or shaming them and you want to focus on a good behavior and their effort so uh, you want them to know that you are there to support them in their learning journey 
Yeah, so this is my son. He was working on a Chinese assignment and it was very difficult for him. But, you know, he, 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 didn't, he didn't enjoy Chinese, but he was willing to try because I was there to support him. Mm. All right, so these are the five things, again, uh, that you can do to create a positive learning environment at home. So I share a lot of tips and examples today. And uh, I want to end off this presentation by asking all of you to think of one change, just one thing out of the many things that we shared today, you know, from me and from Angela. What is the one change that you like to make to, today in your home learning environment? And also remember this, even though you guys are not teacher, you are your children's best and first teachers. All, All right. right. Thank you. Thank you, That's Finn. Thank you so segment. much. Thank you so much for the practical tips. So if you want to know more about creating a positive home learning environment, you can look for Finn on Instagram. Her Instagram handle is at happy taught shell. So moving on to our next q and I'm sure all of you are very uh, excited about how your questions will be answered. First of all, can we ask Angela first? We have several questions on how to make our child, our children more interested in learning. For example, I, I see this question. If our child doesn't really enjoy writing, how can we inspire him or her to actually write with joy? The child is five years old. Okay. Um, I think I think just now we shared quite a number of tips on how we can help our children be interested in learning, right? So in particular for this, um, how to write with joy. Okay. Um, I'm not other than you know we there there are many ways to learn how to write. So for example, um, we we spoke about writing on sand earlier, and you know alternatively you can also think about how we can write for fun together. So it could be parent and child writing together. Do something that is uh, informal. For example, um, if you're going to the su supermarket, right? Get your child to write the shopping list with you. Mommy is going to buy eggs today. How do we write eggs? So your child will be happily doing things for you, know, because they want to impress you, right? They want to be, uh, they, they want to be in your good books. Or you can also get them to, for example, label things around the house. Um, maybe just create a label bedroom, right? And then just paste it on your door. Or you can write notes to a a parent, for example, if you prepare daddy's lunchbox, dear daddy, this is your lunch for today. So those are the fun writing activities that we can um, get our children to do. And um, alternatively, you can also think about providing um, different kind of writing tools. Some, they may enjoy markers, they may enjoy crayons, color pencils, just make their writing look very colorful. I think, I think it will make children more interested in writing. Mm, so there are a lot of tools in the market nowadays. Some some pencils I know are able to be written on glass as well. Probably yeah. children will find that interesting. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Our uh, next question for Finn. Uh, actually, a lot of parents are very envious of their home learning space. They find that your yeah, house is so pretty. <laughs> but the thing is that um, I think for a lot of um Singaporeans, um, making learning corners or or, or like getting the space out is a little bit challenging when our space is actually quite restricted at home. How do we solve the problem when our house isn't too big? We don't have really a dedicated huge space for learning or, or to have fun. Right, so I, I want to, I mean, even though my space looks big, it's not, it's really not big. I live in a regular apartment and I live in smaller apartments. So I have moved homes several times over the last few years. You know, I live in space uh, like with only two bedrooms, 700 square feet with my three children. And I, I'm, I, I'm honest to tell you that, you know, uh, first of all, this is a very common question that I always receive from, from my um from parents. Uh, it's really, really not the space, the amount of space that you have. It's how you use the space and the materials in the space that matters more. So if you have a uh, space constraint, I think it is even more important to think about how the, the design and the you know what goes into the space. So uh, you know things. Um, I also encourage uh, parents to you know look at um, decluttering, like things that are not not um, prioritize your space. So because we are, we already are so uh, limited in the, in the space, right? So prioritizing prioritizing your space. You know, how what what each space is used for, what goes into is each space is a lot more important. Yeah. So um, yeah. Think about th think more about what you want to put in a space. And probably throwing out all those things that the child has outgrown is pretty important mm, as well in order to create yes. more space. Right. Yeah. Right. Can I just add on to that? So another idea is that, you know, if you really don't have space, we can always make use of a box or a luggage, for example. You can mm. place your materials inside there, right? And your child will know that every time they open the luggage, there's different learning materials inside there. 
So there's mm. this element of surprise and, and you can place different activities for them uh, in that box or in that luggage. So so uh, you don't really need to have a huge space uh, when, when it comes to that. Lah, yeah. So mm. for, for example, uh, also I I, I want to, uh, that, that was a really good idea. So like having like a mobile learning space, yeah, like a luggage, it seems like it's like a mobile learning space. And then let's say for books, like, you know, books are wonderful. We talk about the benefits of books, but do, like, you know, we, we are strugg struggling with the, the the space that the the amount of space that the books take up, right? So you know, so work with what you have. So if you feel that you have limited space at home, then I encourage you to go to the library because you can switch out the books every time. And there's you know, library has so many books, so you don't have to buy all the books and put them at home. Just go to the library, borrow the books. When your child is done, then you can return. And books that your child children are really interested in, that's maybe that's when you can invest and uh, buy them and place them at home. And then you know, let's say if you have a smaller space at home, then you know you can create a smaller learning corner you don't have to have a big shelf it can just be like two trays a small table so work with the space that you have mm. okay and then another question for Angela uh, it's about how to make our child more interested in learning as well how to motivate them uh, there's this um, parent who asks how can I motivate my child to study on his own and have some independence in his or her studies because I think a lot of parents encounter the same thing every time they get home. Have you finished your homework? Why haven't you finished your homework? What are you doing when I'm not at home? Why you never do? Why you never do this? Why you make me check? Why can't you why can't you be more like be more responsible for your own homework? <laughs> Sounds very familiar, right? <laughs> okay. So, so how I can think... we motivate to do that themselves to have some self-discipline? <laughs> Uh, having self-discipline is an executive function. So <laughs> want to do that through the activities that we do at home. But I think in this case, right, um, try to understand what your child's like and uh, and then use that to spark the interest. For example, um, if your child loves Lego, right, then use Lego to support the learning. And when they show that they are doing it self-directedly, you need to acknowledge their effort to be independent. You need to show your child that you recognize and appreciate their, their, their initiative, their proactiveness. Or you can also join them in their activities or learning and make their learning journey fun. And at the same time, you know, while you're doing that, you're actually bonding with them. Hmm. Yeah, so how to make it fun, it's a challenge, but I'm sure a lot of parents have gotten a lot of great tips from tonight's webinar. And also, um, just now when actually both speakers mentioned something about reading together with the child, preferably on a, on a daily basis. And then there's this parent with this question, uh, my two kids have different opinions on books to read. How do the three of us read together? Or should I read with one child at a time? Okay. Okay, so I can take this question. So I have three kids, right? So um, each of them, have their, they have their own preferences in book. So what I do is to read one book to them. So each one can choose one book to read together. And for my older children, they, they, uh, they usually have, the books are usually longer. So we don't read the entire book in one session. Probably we read one or two chapters uh, every night. And um, what happened is that, you know, my, I encourage my children, but even when I'm reading to my four, four-year-old, and I encourage my seven-year-old, my 10-year-old to just sit around and enjoy, you know, and enjoy this reading time together. And sometimes they still enjoy the children picture books a lot. Yeah, uh, because this is, I mean, this is a really a bonding time, a family bonding time. Uh, we just all sit together and listen to stories. And uh, at the same time, I feel that, um, you know, when we take turns to read books for each child, it also shows, it also shows our children that, you know, we are, uh, we are trying to be respectful uh, uh, to each other's uh, preferences and choices. You know, every kid is unique and they have their own preferences. So we are all, you know, we, we just want to, we want to respect each other's um, uh, preferences. Hmm. Actually, yeah. of course, I think it would be great if each child has their own interest on what type of books they like to read, if they make reading really like part of their daily routine. But I'm sure some, pro some parents do encounter this problem as well. The children doesn't like reading as much as they like screen time. So the question, next question for Angela um, from this parent, how do we reduce the screen time during meal time, especially when the parents are busy with chores and work? I think this also boils down to self-discipline and, and, and what kind of things can we like inspire them to, 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 to be interested in? Okay, so I think first and foremost, we need to be able to set the rules, right? Meal time is a family bonding time. So no devices um, on the table. And when we say that to children, 
uh, daddy's mommy, make sure you your model that as well. Okay, you need to talk to your child, ask questions, you know, to check in on their day. And um, wait, I I think I think this is one. So setting rules, right? And another thing about screen time is that um. We we while well, while we know that there are negative effects to children if they're exposed to prolonged screen time, we shouldn't discount the fact for purposeful and meaningful screen time. So for example, I, I did see another question that asked about, you know, whether we can use apps to teach children reading. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not, right? I mean, if you if if the child, if you really need the child to be engaging in some screen time because you need some time to do your work. Then, um, then reading an ebook may be excellent, and the ebook may come together with a read aloud track. For example, it helps them in their listening and their comprehension skills. So that's what we call meaningful screen time. But try and balance it out with uh, outdoor time or non screen mm. time, so that um they are not you know exposed to prolonged screen time. And I think recently MOH also re you know came out with this guidance on the number of time uh, the duration of time uh, children should be on screen. So, so we should we should also take note of that, lah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. And next question for Finn is our last question for today's Q and A as well. Um, this is very common problem that parents face because regardless of the child's age, how do we combat the child's short attention span? They probably cannot sit there for half an hour to learn or to read a book or right. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so first of all, I think we need to manage our expectation. Um, for attention span, you know, the younger the children, the the the, low, the shorter their attention span. So maybe for like two year old, uh, uh, for children, right, we are looking at two to five minutes of attention span per year of age. So let's say for a two year old, we are looking at four to ten minutes of attention span. So if you are expecting your four two year old to sit there and do worksheet with you for, for 30 minutes, that's not gonna happen. Like this is developmentally not, not possible. And also, it also boils down to the, the kind of activities. Uh, is it suitable for the children? Is it too challenging for the children? Is it too easy for the children? And is it um, something that is packed to, to their age? So for younger children, of course, they, are, they, they need a lot of concrete experiences. So they are not going to sit well with, with uh, worksheets or flashcards, right? Um, so, you know, uh, um, a lot of the factors will affect the attention span and their focus. So age is one thing, the, the, uh, no, the type of activities is one thing. And I also want to highlight that um, I, I want to, uh, I always uh, use this analogy that, you know, if you think about, uh, think, to think of attention span and focus like muscle. So you want to build your muscle, you need to exercise, right? So it's the same for attention span. If you want your children to have longer attention span, right, you need to find ways to stretch it. And how do you find ways to stretch your children's attention span? Um, it it's really to not to interrupt them when they are focusing. Let's say if they are playing something, they are building something, and they are you know they are so focused on building a tower, and they spend like you no know, 10, 20 minutes building a tower. Don't interrupt them. Yeah, don't you know if it's possible, just don't interrupt them. Let them finish building whatever they they they, they are building. It's really through all this like playing, you know, prolonged playing, or when they are exploring their interests, they are doing something they are interested in. Let's say they are reading a book that they are interested in, or um. Uh, or they are you know building blocks uh, or if they are painting or drawing that's when when they are is really through all these activities not when they are doing worksheets or they, when they are doing homework all these daily uh, experiences of them focusing and we not interrupting them is how we can really stretch their attention span I think that's a very good reminder for me as well because whenever my child is doing something I'll remind her hey little thing remember to drink a water ah? yeah <laughs> no, I know I stop <laughs> So I, I tell a lot of parents, you know, you know, you, you put yourself as a you know um a uh, spectator, you know, put on a uh, be be a spectator and not a commentator. So you don't mm. have to comment everything, you know, your child is mm. doing something. Oh, you did this. Oh, you, what is this? You don't have to comment too much. You know, when your child is really in a zone, in a flow, right? Just watch. Yeah, just watch. And then when they are ready to engage you, they will look up and they will look to you and then, oh, mommy. Look at this that I built. That's when you know that, oh, okay, you know, this is a natural break in your focus. That's when you can step in and then you can engage with them. And then when they're back in their flow, then we just keep quiet. <laughs> ah, okay, now we understand. I'm sure parents have learned a lot today. Okay, great advice and tips from Finn and Angela. Thank you to the both of you so much. We have learned so much today. I'm sure a lot of parents have been taking a lot of notes as well. Um, if your questions are not answered tonight, please don't worry. We'll try to answer all the other questions which we haven't mentioned just now during the QA session on this website, which is spf2023.com. After all our webinars, 
are over. So probably give us uh, like two weeks time. We'll try to answer all the questions, okay, to make sure that parents still get valuable uh, advice, uh, even the webinars are over. And thank you everyone for joining us in today's webinar. Singapore Parenting Festival 2023 is proudly brought to you by MediaCorp and the Asian Parent. And this festival is made possible by this key partners, Gold Partners, PCF Sparkle Tots, Dumax Do Grow, Scots, and also our content partners, Moms for Life, Dads for Life, Centre for Fathering, and Hoya.